Hey everyone, welcome to Acacia Online. We're so excited that you're joining us here on this Monday night. We can't wait for you to experience everything God has for you this evening. Wherever you're at, just plug in and let's worship together. Here's our gathering. Come on, come on, welcome, welcome, Acacia. We're so glad you're with us tonight. Wherever you are, stand up, join in with us. Come on, put your hands together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Oh, my praise belongs to you forever. Come on, come on. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come on. Woo! hope that God met you exactly where you're watching this evening. In just a second, Pastor Russ is going to bring us our final installment of Jesus Over Everything. We want you to be involved with the sermon. Let us know if God is speaking to you. How do I explain what Freedom Group is? It's challenging because it's different for everyone. Uh, your group leader, the folks in your group, and most of all, what you bring into it 
influences your experience. I mean, for the curriculum, it's not something that's novel or unique or exotic. In fact, really, it's mundane. My favorite, favorite chapters were the power of words and forgiveness. See, it's normal stuff. But you get so much out of these chapters. I mean, at this stage in your life, how much more is there to learn about words or about forgiveness? Uh, and about new things in, in these areas. Turns out a lot. It's about the depth that you dive and explore and learn about. It adds an entire other dimension to your understanding. The best way I can describe Freedom Group is like a chocolate chip cookie. Chips Ahoy makes a delicious cookie. You can eat it all day. It's a good cookie and, and no one would argue with that. And your whole life you've been eating those cookies and everything's great. You and your friends talk about cookies and you know all about chocolate chip cookies. You're like an expert, you've eaten so many. But then you have one of those fresh baked by grandma chocolate chip cookies. And you realize that until this moment, you've never really eaten a cookie. You're forever changed. That's what Freedom Group will do to you. And once you have that amazing cookie, you want everyone you come in contact with and everyone you know to try one and know what it's like. You're gonna be hearing stories like that over the next couple of weeks as we get ready to launch our groups on the 21st. You've already heard and you will be hearing that uh, you can go on the app and you can look at uh, what groups are available to you. Uh, all of that will be open tomorrow and I will tell you a little bit of insider information that may actually be live today. So uh, the rest of the population will have access to it tomorrow, but consider that some insider information. So if you go on the app, on the homepage, you can click on Life Groups. You can get all the information that you want right there. So welcome. Welcome to church. Welcome to the house of God. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to put your hands together as we welcome Old Hammond, everybody online, everybody at Segan, everybody watching, everybody. Welcome home. Welcome home. Shout out to you, OHC. So we're wrapping up this series today called Jesus Over Everything. I'm going to count to three and real loudly. I want you to say Jesus Over Everything. One, two, three. Jesus over everything. Let's turn it up about seven decibels. One, two, three. Jesus over everything. There you go. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Uh, in week one, we talked about the fact that Jesus should be placed over your pride. And what we learned there in week one was his preferences are better preferences than our preferences. And then that led us to week two where we discussed the fact that Jesus should be placed over our apathy. And we learned that passion is intentional. It's never accidental. Some people are like, well, I'm just not passionate about the Lord. And, and as I tried to explain it, and if you missed it, you can go back and hear it on the app. But... You're, you become passionate about the things that you keep in front of you. And, and, I, and I use the example, good old South Louisiana here. If you're passionate about hunting, it's because you're always in the duck line or you're always in the deer stand. If you're passionate about exercise, it's because you're always at the yoga studio or you're always at the gym. It's, it's the things that you keep in front of you. And those things aren't wrong. But, but sometimes we just kind of we kind of complain because the Lord won't just put some magic pixie dust on us and we become super passionate. Well, we have to be intentional. We have to keep Jesus in front of us so that we don't become apathetic. Week three, we, turn, we learned the fact that Jesus should be placed over our ambiguity, and we, we did what I call the annual State of the Church Address, and we celebrated where we've come from, and we talked about the vision that God has given us going into 2021. And then last weekend, I think last weekend really helped some people because we talked about Jesus over chaos, and we learned that Jesus is a storm walker, and he's empowered you to do the same thing. And then that leads us to today, part five, where we are going to be discussing Jesus over lust. And you've already heard, you'll continue to hear, but it's PG-12, so if you've got an Acacia kid in here, now's a great time for you to get them checked in in Acacia Kids. And if you're watching online, uh, I'm not going to be graphic, I'm not going to be over the line, but I am going to address some things that need to be addressed. And because I am doing that, I want you to understand today I'm just talking to you. Everybody say, he's just talking to us. It's, it's pastor to church today. So if you're, if you're not yet a believer, 
This is going to be helpful for you as well. Come back next Sunday. We're going to give the gospel presentation. You're going to have an opportunity to say yes to the Lord, and your life will be changed forever. But today, I just want to, I want to kind of deviate a little bit, and I want to talk to the church. I want to help you, and I want to equip you. It's just kind of pastor to church conversation today. So to begin this, I can already sense in the force that some of you are like, oh, Lord, what is he going to say? You're like already all uptight. So I want to start with a joke, okay? We're going to talk about lust, but I'm going to to begin with a joke, okay? I read this story the other day about this little girl talking to her grandma, and she asked, Grandma, how old are you? And the grandma replied, Dear, you should not ask questions like that to a grown-up. Grown-ups are very quiet about their age. And so the next day, the little girl said, Grandma, how much do you weigh? (laughs) Which is so funny, but Grandma slapped her. No, she didn't slap her. Grandma said, Honey, you shouldn't ask grown-ups how much they weigh. That is not polite. And so the following day, the girl came back with a a really funny-looking smirk on her face, and she said, Grandma, I know how old you are. You're 67. And I know how much you weigh. You're 145 pounds. And the grandma was surprised, and she said, My goodness, honey, how how do you know that? And the little girl just kind of smiled. She said, You left your driver's license on the table, and I read all about it. And so grandma said, oh, there's a lot of information on the driver's license. And the little girl said, yep, that's right. And your driver's license also told me that you got an F in sex. (laughs) I'm here all day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ready? I don't want you to get an F in sex. I don't want you to get an F in today's content. I don't want you to get an I don't want you to get a failing grade whenever it comes to your knowledge of what God's word says about sex and sexuality and the power of lust. Because here's the problem, the world has kind of convinced a lot of people, even believers, that this thing called lust is kind of like a harmless rubber snake when in all of actuality it's it's more like a dangerous dangerous timber rattler. And unless we gain a biblical understanding of its power, lust will inflict a tremendous amount of pain on our lives. And so referencing week one, it's not about your preferences. And I say that with all of the love and, and, and compassion that I can, that I can say. But that's, what, that's week one. We, it, it's not about your preferences. It, it's about God's preferences because God's preferences are better than our preferences. And so we're going to anchor ourselves to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you'll see it on the screen or in your notes. And if you're new with us, whenever I say in your notes, I'm referring to the smartphone app that you can download. But follow along with me, and and it goes like this in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is a letter from the Apostle Paul, and he said, it's God's will. Everybody say, it's God's will. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. It's God's will that you should avoid sexual immorality. It's God's will that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who who don't know the Lord. Jumping down to verse 7, for God did not call us to be impure, but he called us to be holy. He called us to live a holy life. And verse 8 is, is, is bringing the heat. Therefore, anyone who, who rejects this instruction does not reject the human being that's bringing the instruction. But if you, if you reject this, you're, you're actually you're rejecting God. The very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So it's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to go back through a couple of parts of this, of this passage and just, and just try to drill home. God's will. That's that's God's plan for your life. Whenever we say God's will, that's God's best plan for your best life. It's, it's, It's just like if you're a parent and you want your child to grow up and succeed and you want them to to experience success. God wants his children to grow up and succeed and experience success. And the church says amen to that. So it's God's will then that you should be sanctified. So sanctification is this theological term that means the ongoing growth that one would experience. Justification is is the moment of salvation. It's whenever you are made just in the eyes of God. It's it's justification. And and it's just as if I had never sinned before. That's that's the word justification. Sanctification. Justification happens in a moment. Sanctification happens all of your life. It's the ongoing, ongrowing process of you becoming spiritually mature. And it's God's will then that you should also avoid sexual immorality. And and in my reading, I was looking at some commentaries, and one of the commentaries went into great detail about making sure that the reader would understand. 
See, in modern day, we think that, wow, sex is just this, it's everywhere, and it's, so, it's, it's such a big deal, and, and, and it's so powerful, and there's no way that I could ever really live godly in reference to the ramifications of what Scripture is teaching us. But, but Paul is addressing then what we're trying to address now. And so what he's saying is loose sex wasn't just a problem then, it's a problem now. It's not just a problem now, it was a it was a problem then. That's what I love about God's word is it's so applicable to all areas of our life. But it goes on. It's also God's will that you would control yourself. <laughs> you got to control yourself in a way that is honorable and holy. The desire that's, that's in the godly people should not look like the lust that's in ungodly people. And God did not call us to be impure. He called us to be, to be pure. And here's what I want you to understand. You've heard me say this at Acacia sometimes. Whenever you understand teachings like this, the Lord is not just flexing his godly muscles and saying, listen to me because I am God. It's kind of like whenever you're a parent and you say, you can't go to that party just because I said so. You're really not saying just because I said so. You're saying that because it's probably not a good environment for your child to go to. So the Lord really is looking out for our best interest and our benefit. And so you'll see it on the screen. I love this. This is talking about purity, but it's talking about purity for our profit. It, it's, it's not just so that God can say, I told you so, or don't do that. It's, it's God's best it's God's reward for you and I following in his teachings. And then again, guys, verse 8 is, is one of the strongest in the entire New Testament. If you reject this teaching, you're not just rejecting Pastor Russ. You are rejecting God. And that is as strong as it possibly can get. So to learn how to apply this passage through the lenses of lust, I'm going to give you this morning three principles of lust. Number one on the screen or in your, new, in your notes, we're going to talk about the root of lust. I'm going to count to three, and I want everybody to say that out loud, the root of lust. One, two, three. So to begin understanding the root of lust, let me give you a quick definition on the screen or in your notes. Lust is the craving to improperly gratify fleshly desires. Lust is the craving to improperly gratify fleshly desires. But I want you to listen. I want you to focus on the last two words of what I just said, which, of course, is fleshly desires. And the reason that I'm trying to get you to drill down on those words and focus on those words is because this is going to help you if you'll listen, okay? Listen closely. The desire idea in and of itself is not bad. The concept of desire is not in and of itself a bad idea. In fact, desire is a God idea. And I want you to understand that Genesis 1, the very first of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, Genesis 1 and 27 on the screen. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Look at verse 28. God blessed them and said, get after it, y'all. That's the South Louisiana translation. He said, be fruitful and multiply, increase in number. So God said, it's go time. And Adam said, glory. Come on, somebody. That's not actually in the scripture, but if I would have written that, I would have put that in there, okay? But seriously, God made man, and God made woman, and he instilled in them sexual desires that were attached to their physical feelings. So you have to understand that the very concept, the root of what we're talking about, this idea of desire in and of itself is not a bad thing because God placed desire inside of us. But now we're fixing to see where the desire gets off track. Now we're going to see the root of this thing called lust. Genesis chapter 2. We just read out of Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam and Eve, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are free. This is the words of God. You are free to eat of any tree in the garden except this one. Genesis 3, very next chapter. Verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty, and I love that word crafty. He's slippery, literally. The serpent was more, was more slippery, was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, very, very important four words, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And if you were awake just about 45 seconds ago, you realize that is not what God said. 
That's not at all what God said. But that is exactly how the enemy works. You see, what the devil does is he takes something that God said and he twists it and he turns it into something that it was never intended to be in the first place. And that's what lust is. The devil took what God intended for good, this word called desire, and he twisted it into something that it was never intended to be. So I'm I'm stressing this because I want you to understand that in my preaching about this concept of lust, I'm not suggesting that you ignore or or try to repress your God-given sexual drive. I'm just saying that he placed something in you for a healthy purpose. Here's what I want you to understand. The the problem is that any time that we try to fill a godly space with something that is not godly, it never works. It never suffices. It, it, It never satisfies. Anything ungodly placed in a spot that is reserved for godly, it never satisfies. That's why lust has an insatiable appetite. So I gave you a a definition of lust earlier. Now, like on on the other side of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, let me me try to say it a little bit more succinctly on the screen. Lust is the seeking to satisfy a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. You've You've got something inside of you. You've got a desire that's inside of you that God placed there. But whenever we step into the realm of lust, what we try to do is we try to take something that is ungodly and satisfy a godly itch that was placed inside of us on purpose, and it will, it will never work. Here's another example. I can be hungry, and I can drink all the water that I want to, and it will appease me for a little bit. But whenever you're hungry, you need food. You need sustenance. You need, you need nourishment, right? So incorrect manners of appeasing hunger ultimately will not work. And that incorrect approach is a lot like how we try to solve the issues with lust. And so take everything that I've said so far, put it in the context of this teaching called Jesus over everything. And if we're saying Jesus over everything, then by default, we take lust and we put it under Jesus. If Jesus is over everything, then we take lust and we put, make sure that we place that under Jesus. Our sexuality is a gift to be enjoyed by a man and a woman in the context of a godly relationship called marriage. But ever since the fall, sexuality has been perverted and misappropriated acts of lust and self-gratification that are many times contrary to the word of God. But another passage in the New Testament, Colossians 3 and 5, tells us how we are to address the root of lust. You'll see it. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which all are idolatry. And so if you're following each week, if you're connecting the dots, this points back to week one. That's why I began how I began in week one, by talking about our preferences. And, and because what we do is we, this pride wells up into our, in, into our life and we think that, that I want what I want. I want my preferences and I don't care what God's preferences are for me. And again, if you grew up and your parents were anywhere close to your life, they, they, would, they would place limitations on you. You thought that they were limitations, but now you see that they were just put, they put protection around you to keep you from stepping into something that you weren't prepared to step into. But, but in reference to lust, if we don't put this stuff to death, what we're doing, listen closely, listen closely, what we're doing is we're saying, God, I know better for me than what you know for me and so I'm going to put my preferences before you. Listen, and anytime we put our preferences before him, it gets really complicated because it becomes a word called idolatry. You're not kneeling down before some, some wooden statue. You're, you're, not, you're not kneeling down in front of some historical monument or whatever, but you're saying, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but what I'm saying is actually more important. My preferences are actually more important than your preferences. And so now that you know that this thing called lust is very deeply rooted into humanity, let's now consider a modern manner in which this is manifested immorally. Number two on the screen is the repulsiveness of lust. The repulsiveness of lust. Because when ungodly lust is manifested into the reality of our lives, it's ugly. And the reason that it's ugly is, again, because... What, has been, what, is, what is transpiring is something that God created to be beautiful, something that God created to be intimate, and the enemy has twisted it into something that it was never intended to be. 
And there's so many angles that I could, that I could drill down on this and try to help you understand it in, re- in reference to the repulsiveness of lust. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, this thing called pornography due to its, due to its increasingly uh, sense of acceptance and also its increasingly sense of accessibility. Parents, listen to me. Your child is at most three clicks away from anything that they want to see. And if you think that your child will not do it just because of their last name, please, please, can, can, will you just let me help you? Ever since the fall, we've had a fallen nature about us. And if all of their friends around them are saying, hey, you're three, qu- you're, you're, you're three clicks away from whatever, you, then they're going to be tempted to go three clicks away, and they're going to, they're going to, back in my day, boys and girls, we had to work for it. We had to, we had to go spend the night at somebody's house that their dad wasn't a believer and had some magazines. We had to sneak in when everybody was asleep, and we had, we had to work hard to see something. Now, it's everywhere. I mean, it, it's absolutely everywhere. And so to understand this clearly, I've got this on the screen for you. Pornography starts out attractive, but it ends up being repulsive. It starts out as something that, is, that you think is beautiful, you think is attractive, but it ends up being something that's, that's very ugly. You think that you're dabbling, listen, you think that you're dabbling in something that's caught your attention, but you fail to realize that it's damaging everything around you. I've got a great story for you, a fascinating illustration. Scientists have now observed that certain kind of ants have a real passion, have a, literally a, a sweet tooth for the granular substance that's left behind a ca- when a caterpillar crawls across the floor. So if a caterpillar crawls across the floor, you see that little, that little shiny line that they leave behind them? That's actually like a granular kind of a substance that there's a certain breed of ants and certain kinds of ants, they, they love it. They, they, they are absolutely passionate about it. And these ants, once they've tasted it, they become hooked, they become addicted, and so they seek out caterpillars. Now, they won't go out and kill the caterpillar. They'll go out and several of them, this is incredible, listen to this. They'll go out and collectively they'll pick up the caterpillar and they'll bring it back to the nest. And they'll bring it down inside the nest. And so unwittingly they don't realize it, but they brought home an enemy in disguise because the caterpillar is brought inside. And the whole time that the caterpillar is inside, he is eating the unborn eggs of the unborn ants that are in there. Usually a threat like this to a colony would be fought with great intensity, but the adult ants, please hear me guys, the adult ants enjoy the tasty residue of the guests so much that they're oblivious to the fact that everything that they care about is being devoured in the process. And that's lust. That's pornography. That illustration is the perfect picture for the dangers of what we're talking about here. You'll see it on the screen. Lust has an insatiable appetite, and when you improperly feed it, you only crave more. Last time I talked about this was about four or five years ago. We called it the, the biggest elephant in the room. I don't know if some of you are around for that, but I told this story then because I think it's so powerful and so profound. But the Native Americans used to have problems with wolves, and the wolves would come in at night and, and, and even kill people. Um, it, it, was, it was a serious problem, and they couldn't figure out how to kill them. And so somebody came up with the idea one time, let's get a, let's get a knife and let's put, you know, from our hunt, let, let's, let's get some blood from the animal, let's put it on the blade, and then we'll get the handle. And they, they just stuck the, the knife down in, in the snow. So the blade was sticking up and it was covered with blood. And at night, of course, the, the wolf would smell it and would start sniffing around and would come up and would smell this blood and it would take a lick and it would, oh, this is, this is lunch, this is good. And they, they would start licking that and because the blade, listen, because the blade was so cold, it made their, their tongue numb and, and so they actually began to lacerate their own tongue and they tasted more blood and so they licked the blade even more so and then, of course, before long it was too late and they would go out couple of hundred yards into the woods and they would die. They would bleed out because of the dangers, because of the cause, because of the, the, the harm that they had done to their own life. And they didn't realize it. That's porn. And the world says that it's, 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 it's just, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal. But actually Jesus references things of this nature as utterly sinful. Matthew chapter 5, you have heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. I think everybody's on the same page there. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And that is exactly where porn brings you. And so again, pornography is literal 
spiritual perversion. It's taking something that God intended for something that was good, and he, he's twisted it, and it's something that has become, become terrible. Because those four words, did God really say that those words of the enemy are some of the most powerful that he ever says? Because it gets you thinking. Like, that was, I mean, the Bible was written a long time ago. And we live right here, and there's a whole lot of things going on. I mean, like, I, you start justifying. Like, I bet he meant something different because now we have access to this. And, and you start saying, I bet he really would lighten up a little bit if he lived here in 2021. Because you, did God really say that you couldn't? Did God really mean that? And the enemy has taken something that God has said, and he's distorted it, and we're all confused. And the second thing that you need to understand about pornography, it, it is fake. It's not real. It's, 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 it's simply not real. Besides the spiritual damage that it does to your soul, there's the emotional damage that it does all around you because whenever you watch something like that, you have certain expectations that get set in your mind, and whenever you are, have a level of expectations, and then here's the level of reality, you realize that this gap is what we like to call frustration and disappointment. The individuals in these films are, are actors. They... They are acting. Okay, let me lighten the mood a little bit. Let me just ask you, do you really think that there was a Death Star that blew up? <laughs> it wasn't. It was a movie. D do you really think, old, old school, do you really think that E.T. ever made it home? <laughs> do you really think that Katniss Everdeen shot poisonous bugs from 200 yards away with a bow and arrow that she made out of sticks and twine? That she, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not real. Neither is porn. Whenever you watch it, you set yourself up for false expectations. On the screen, i got to hurry. When your perceived expectations are not met, disappointment takes the place of where satisfaction could be. And I could preach about that for a long time. But i got to hurry. So now you understand the root of lust. Now you understand the repulsiveness of lust whenever it's manifested. Now let me conclude with some good news, and that is the remedy of lust. Number three is the remedy of lust. And here's the application. Here's where I want you to, to understand this, this is what you need to do to solve this issue, to fight this battle. I want you to realize that the remedy begins by realizing that you have to say no to something that you want for something that you want more. You have to say no to something that you want for something that you want more. So to equip you into action, I want to conclude as practically and empowering as I possibly can. Reminder, Colossians 3 and 5, put to death lust and sexual immorality. Put it to death. The problem is we flirt with it. We keep it right there on the peripheral so we can just kind of dabble every once in a while. We're not like all in, but we're just kind of, no, it says put it to death. Put lust to death. Put sexual immorality to death. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3, avoid sexual immorality and control yourself. That's why I want to, I want to, I want to spell it different. And I, want to, I don't want to say control yourself. I want to say control yourself. That's what you need to do. You need to control yourself. So got a little experiment here, okay? Everybody listen very closely. I'm going to teach you how to control yourself. Ready? It's going to be good. You, got, you better listen. Here is how you control yourself. Whatever you do, don't think of the color blue. Whatever you do, do not think of the color blue. Whatever you do, do not think of an airplane. Like, get control of yourself. Come on, you're not listening. Whatever you do, don't think of a flower. Whatever you do, don't think of a flower. My point is made. The remedy of lust is not merely the avoidance of lust. Because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's tough to put something to death that's everywhere. It's tough to control your thoughts whenever they're everywhere. But here's the hook. Here's the hook this entire message hangs upon. None of what I have challenged you here with today is a, is a threat to your resolve. Today has not been a challenge in your willpower. I pray that you would understand today has been, a, it, it's been an exercise in the releasing of the Holy Spirit into your life. And some of you are like, what? I haven't made that connection yet. Hold on. I'm not challenging your willpower. I'm challenging you to let the Holy Ghost work in your life. Because if you had the power to overcome all these things of lust that bother you, you would have already have defeated them. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem. But the remedy of lust in your life is realizing the power of the Holy Ghost in your life and, and letting the Holy Spirit work in your life. So here's what you need to do. Galatians chapter 5. You can follow along with me on the screen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
And looky there. Self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit? A result of the Spirit. A consequence of the Spirit. A, a fleshing out of the, of the Spirit. A, a, a result, a fruit of the Spirit is your ability to control yourself. Self-control, not willpower, because that's what we try to do. We try to just will ourselves into it, but that's not what Scripture is teaching us. The, the effect, the result, the outcome, the fruit of the Spirit is that you will be able to have self-control. And we talked about this, I think it was in week three. Scripture says, you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. Come on, everybody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So what you need to be doing is you just need to realize you've been trying to fight a four-alarm fire with a water pistol that you got from Dollar General when you could have access to the Holy Ghost working up in your life. That's what you need to realize. <laughs> Amen. So how do you do that? Throw me that water. Some of you are like, okay, how do I get rid of the air in this? Air is lust. How do I get rid of the lust in my life? How do I, because, because I can't just like, if you just try to get, I can't just like get it out of there because then it distorts what this thing was, was supposed to be in the first place. Here is how you get the air out of this bottle. Ready? Watch closely. As I'm filling this bottle with water, air is leaving the bottle. And so if you want to learn how to get lust out of your life, if you will fill yourself with the Holy Spirit and you will let the Holy Ghost work in your heart and work in your life, then suddenly there is no more room for anything in here because there's no more room for the bad stuff because the good stuff, is, is, is you're, you're filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you have self-control. You're, mm. <laughs> I, I, Josh, I wish you had an organ right now and I had a white hanky because I would just go all over the place right now. But listen, you're, you're, you're trying to fight the battle with your own power. And the Lord is saying, don't, bro, I got you. Let me help you in the battle. Let me help you in the fight. Let me, let me help you. Because you've been trying to do this all on your own, and if you will just let me, I'm telling you, we can turn this around. This, this, because some of you have been, maybe you've been defeated. Maybe, maybe, you, uh, maybe, maybe you feel just like that you can't catch a break. You can't get this figured out, and you feel like such a failure whenever it comes to lust. Listen, that is not how the Lord wants you to leave feeling. He wants you to leave feeling empowered. Realizing that you have learned the remedy for this battle that you've been trying to face on your own. Now, will you have a magical force field around you and you'll never see a good-looking woman? You'll never see a good-looking man? You'll never have another bad thought? That's not what I'm saying. Let me borrow an old-school Tom Fred Tenney idea that he told me, an old preacher a long time ago. He said, son, everybody called me son, I guess, because anyway, he said, son, you, you can't, listen, you can't control a bird from flying over your head but you can prevent him from building a nest there. You will have some thoughts. You will have some battles. And you get to determine if you're going to just let it stay there or if you're going to say, uh-uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit that is in me, get that thought out. I'm focusing on God. I'm focusing on something that's good. It's your choice. It's absolutely your choice. And so I want you to leave here today feeling absolutely, utterly empowered that God can turn this whole thing around for you. He can, he can, he can take what you're battling and, and he can help you defeat it. You don't have to fight this on your own. Acacia, that was an amazing word from Pastor Russ. Now we've got some next step for you. If this was your first time watching with us this evening, we'd love for you to click the link in the comment to fill out a digital connect card so we can start a conversation with you. One of our cultural values here at Acacia is that we practice generosity. If you'd like to partner with us, you can click the Give link in the comment below to help support the mission, vision, and culture of Acacia Church. 
Thanks so much for being with us this evening. We'll see you next week.